we have SETI, the Search for uh, Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And uh, here's a few, a group of scientists, so-called scientists, astronomers there. Uh, they were searching for aliens, okay? And uh, they use that array out there, and they use uh, a lot of uh, hours uh, with public money <laughs> and to look for extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. And sometimes I wonder, you know, maybe we should look for uh, intelligence where these people work, because I don't think there's much intelligence there. And again, I think, um, you know, looking for aliens in the wrong places, that's what I call it. It's highly unlikely, bordering on impossible to detect another civilization. And uh, it's known as Fermi's paradox uh, from Enrico Fermi. And uh, Fermi said, you know, it's strange that no one has come and visited us. <laughs> And so why haven't people come here? Why haven't other civilizations come here? Haven't, I mean, if it's like all these people believe that uh, there should be civilizations out there much more advanced than ours, then why aren't those people, why haven't they traveled over here and visited us or conquered us or whatever? And so here's, uh, here's my take on that. Let me take this out of here. Here's my take on that, okay? Reasons for Fermi's paradox. Why no one has visited us, why we can't find intelligence at Cambridge or outside of the earth, okay? Life can't travel interstellarly. I covered that the other couple of uh, times, okay? Uh, we can't travel to the nearest star. Never will, never happen. That'll never happen. It's impossible. It's irrational to think that we can travel to another star, okay? That's the first thing. Um, civilizations are few and far apart in space and time, and very few people ponder this. You know, we've only had, what, 200 years at most, not even 200 years, but let's just be generous and say 200 years of electricity, of real electricity where they started building things using electricity. And maybe give it another 100 years, maybe 300 years, right? Uh, the issue here is 300 years is a drop of water in the ocean of uh, the cosmic ocean you know, in, in, of the universe. I mean, when you look at eternity out there, uh, what is 300 years? Nothing. And here's, you have a planet like the Earth, and we've had, you could say, uh, acquired consciousness in electricity and all this kind of stuff, maybe 300 years now. And this is it, and we're going to become extinct very soon. So that's it. That's about the time frame for any civilization similar to ours out there. Maybe that's 300 years. Just that I'm going to go with that assumption. And so it turns out that, you know, another planet develops and evolves. You have all these animals. Eventually, you have humans like us. The intelligence develops there to our level. By the time they are in the last 300 years of their existence, where they discover things like magnetism, electricity, and all this kind of good stuff and develop technology to be able to listen in on other planets, the other planet is gone because 300 years is nothing you know, in, the, in the scheme of the cosmos. So not only are we separated by distance, but we're separated by time. You know, for two planets that are close together, that have humans, human level intelligence, about the same time, it's almost impossible. That's, that's my take on that. You, it's, I don't know, it might happen somewhere in the universe, maybe two planets which are close together or something like that, very unlikely. Uh, life is a very scarce resource out there. And intelligent life of our level, intelligence of our level, right? Uh, it takes a long time to develop, and it lasts very little, a drop of water, maybe 300 years. For that to happen in two planets which are close together uh, about the same time, almost impossible, I'd say. And so that's my take on that. And uh, then a small window of time in which human level intelligence develops electric, electronic technology, and shortly after becomes extinct. We're about to become extinct, so there's no chance for us to really listen in on a very close civilization that just happens to have human-level intelligence at the same time that we do uh, in the last 300 years of their existence. <laughs> I don't think it's possible. It's, uh, the, the odds are one in a trillion, maybe. And superintelligent humans have the highest level of intelligence that Mother Nature can bequeath. People say, oh, superintelligence out there. No such monster. No such monster. We are the super intelligence. This is it. It doesn't get better than this. If you don't have intelligence, well, you got to complain to your mother. you got to sue her. Okay? But uh, this is it. This is all we get. You know, we don't get any more intelligence than what we have now. If God, uh, the devil, Mother Nature, Father Universe came today and tried to explain to us 
for example, gravity or light or magnetism, we all, or pretty much a lot of us, have the ability to understand what they're trying to tell us. What other super intelligence are you expecting? Some gadget, uh, maybe go through the fourth dimension, even that we would be able to understand if, if explained to us. There is no more intelligence than what humans have. And those people who say, oh no, the super intelligence, they've just watched too many uh, Hollywood movies, you know, Matrix and so on. Nonsense. This is it. You, you don't even have your feet on the ground, you're flying in, in the air, you know. So no, this, what we have is super intelligence. That's it. Doesn't get any better than that. Mother Nature cannot give us more, you know, blessings. And yeah, people don't think that's possible. <laughs> it's out of their range of thought. But yeah, this is it. You don't get any more intelligence than what we get now among humans. This is the highest level of intelligence possible in the entire universe. Okay. What other intelligence are you thinking about? Please describe it for me so that I can understand what this super intelligence that you have in your tiny little mind uh, that you're talking about. What are you talking about? What is super intelligence? My God. UFOs, aliens have never visited or will ever visit Earth. Okay? We can't travel to other stars. No one from any other star can travel here. And we're soon to become extinct, so that's going to be the end of it. Nobody's going to ever even know that we ever existed here on this planet, on this tiny planet here in this side of the universe. So it just goes with a... And people say, Bill, you're not giving us much hope. <laughs> well, uh, I can either give you hope and give you some false, uh, you know, hope or reality. And I'm telling you reality. Reality is that uh, we're going to become extinct very soon, humans. And that's what happened to other humans in other planets way before us. Billions of billions of years before us. Uh, and Big Bang be damned. <laughs> no, the universe is eternal. The universe never had a beginning, never had an end. And that has a lot of consequences. I want you to think about this because you won't be able to sleep today if I tell you what, what I'm going to say next. And that is that there never was, listen carefully, okay? There never was a first human in the universe. Before us, there were other humans in another planet. Before them, there were other humans before them in some other planet in the universe or in several places maybe. And before them, there were others. And before them, there were others. And before them, there were others. I don't know if that sank in. There was never a first human in the universe. The universe is eternal in both directions of time. The universe had never a beginning because matter cannot turn into space. Space cannot turn into matter. Therefore, the universe has always been there. And it had no beginning. And there always was some kind of human. See, we always have this notion that babies are born, so that's when they were created, that, you know, when they came out into the universe, when they began to exist. Father Nature doesn't understand that. Mother, uh, I'm sorry, Mother Nature or Father Universe, they don't understand that. They've been around forever. Okay, so I hope uh, it gets you thinking tonight. <laughs> no first human, ever. Okay. okay, we have a flat earther. Okay, good. We have this flat earther. He says, we can demonstrate the relationship between two systems of di differing pressure. If we have, say, a vacuum system with a low pressure and a system of higher pressure, we know through practical real-world demonstration, people who rely on experiments and they don't understand anything, that those two systems require a barrier between. Yes, yeah, so when people uh, get conclusions from experiments and uh, they don't have the mental capacity to analyze anything, so they say, oh, I saw the experiment, yeah. It's the interpretation that's uh, what's missing here, okay? If we do not have a barrier between, we get equilibrium uh, taking effect. Uh -huh. This is demonstrable uh, fact that can be shown over and over, and this understanding is applied to our everyday uh, lived practical lives. Again, all these people, they lack understanding of physics, and that's unfortunate for them, okay? Because uh, they never make sense of anything. And they want to run experiments. That's a lot of flat earthers are very experimentally oriented. They think uh, experiments have something to do with science. And how do you get it through them? That's you know experiments have nothing at all to do with science. We don't do experiments in science. We don't do experiments in physics. We don't do math in science. We do not use math in physics. Science is about rational explanations, not about doing experiments. We don't we don't do experiments. We explain experiments. Okay? We have to explain the cause, the mechanism. That's why we don't do experiments and we don't use math because math can only describe. We have no use for math in, in science. 
Okay? We have to explain the mechanism. That's what science is about. What the mathematicians call philosophy, that's science. Okay? You have to explain the causes, the mechanism, the especially of the invisible stuff, gravity, magnetism, light. You gotta explain how that works, how Mother Nature does the, all these magic tricks that we can't see or, or touch. Okay? And so these people run experiments and they say, oh, 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 I know something about vacuum, that I can separate uh, lower vacuum from higher vacuum, I need a, a barrier in between. That's the logic, I guess the illogic of this flat earther. Okay, so let's uh, answer him. And uh, what he's thinking about is um, vacuum in a uh, chamber. He's not thinking of vacuum out there in space. That's where the problem is. Okay? He thinks that because he does something as an experiment, he can extrapolate what happens in a chamber out there to space that, uh, and, and, you know, that surrounds the Earth. You can say it that way. I mean, you know, space doesn't surround it, but I guess you know what I mean. It's all that black stuff that's around the Earth. Okay? And so the guy says, hold it, you, you need a barrier because if the, you don't have the barrier, the thing will even out. Poor fellow. Uh, okay, so here it is. We have to explain why the water curves around the Earth, why the air curves around the Earth. And that's because every atom of air and every atom of water is bound to every atom of everything that's on the Earth. In fact, air uh, atoms are bound to air atoms on the other side of the Earth. And water um, atoms and molecules are bound to water molecules on the other side of the Earth. So everything tends towards the center of the Earth, or somewhere in the center, where we have the center of gravity of the Earth. Because the Earth is a sphere and not a flat disk like the heads of these people, okay? And everything tends to the center. And so this, and then what continues after that uh, layer of uh, first water and then air, what continues after that is... Um, fewer and fewer particles. You have particles still, quite a few particles. Uh, in fact, uh, on the uh, moon, you have 10 to the minus 12 tor, like I said, and that means that you have uh, particles per cubic centimeter. Okay, so it's not like there's no particles at all. You do have particles uh, in the um, uh, solar wind. You have uh, particles uh, even on the surface of the moon. You know, th there are particles out there, but much less than what we have here on Earth. That's the issue. And if you go between two galaxies, then you're probably approaching, you know, zero particles. Uh, you know, who knows what's out there? All we can do is calculate and say, well, we think this is what it is, maybe 10 to the minus 19th tor. But nobody knows really, okay, what is between two galaxies. We don't have a, a meter to go out there and measure the uh, vacuum level between two galaxies. But that's as close as you're probably going to get anywhere in the universe to almost a uh, perfect vacuum. And I don't think... Probably anywhere there's a perfect vacuum. Again, remember the ropes crisscross the entire universe. And ropes are not matter in the sense of being atoms. But uh, there's nothing saying that there are no atoms between two galaxies. Maybe there's some gas there, residual gas or whatever, somewhere. Or very, 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 very light gases out there. Or maybe even uh, loose atoms, maybe even neutrons, you know, uh, crisscrossing of ropes. So... Uh, I don't know if there's any place on, in the universe where there's a perfect vacuum. Maybe there is. But for sure, within a solar system where there's so much matter in comparison to between two galaxies, right? In the solar system, you have planets, you have uh, gases, you have um, uh, asteroids, comets. you got a lot of garbage running around the uh, sun. And between every atom, there's a rope, which is the background radiation that they sense out there. Okay? It's the, all these ropes that are cr cr crisscrossing in our vicinity. That's what they're measuring. They call it the uh, remnants of the Big Bang. <laughs> yeah, it's all these ropes that are all around us. And they were able to sense that, okay? And I uh, think that's all it is. And yeah, so in, in the case of this fellow, he says, you know, uh, once you uh, have a vacuum chamber, you need to separate low from high vacuum. Yeah, in a vacuum chamber, you do that. I mean, I work with vacuum chambers. You don't have to tell me that. You have to separate it in a vacuum chamber. It's different than the Earth. Here in the Earth, you're talking about a little planet, a round planet, spherical planet, and you have a gradient, a radial gradient of uh, first water, liquids, then gases, uh, air, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. And then that whittles down to, you know, the, um, it's a, a gradient that ends up in this almost perfect vacuum for our taste, which is minus 12, minus 13 tor. And, and that's, that's, how it, uh, that gradient is, is uh, uh, radially uh, distributed from the center of the Earth. That's what it is. So this notion that this poor fellow has that, 
you know, that two levels of vacuum would even out. Again, it's what people have very tiny minds and they think that an experiment is going to show them what's out there in outer space. And so they don't have the capacity to visualize without doing any experiment. They need to go to the lab and say, I'm going to do an experiment. <laughs> well, do all the experiments you want, but you better come up with a rational explanation. What these people never come up with is with an explanation for gravity, which is the subject we're going to talk about next. Okay, okay let's get on with gravity. Uh, oh, I had one more issue there. Sorry. Let me go with this one. Uh, it has to do with what we talked about the other day, uh, axis. And a fella just says, why is the Earth's axis still? Uh, neither axis is fixed. How do you talk to these people? What am I supposed to do to talk to these people? They're not even listening. The, the, the issue is that a one-dimensional, 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 one-dimensional axis, first doesn't exist, but <laughs> how do you conceptualize a one-dimensional axis spinning? On its, on its axis. <laughs> Can you imagine a one-dimensional axis spinning? And uh, when, when you answer that question, then maybe I'll answer your question, okay? Yeah, we have to put a three-dimensional axis uh, cylinder for you to understand the concept so that you understand the definition of spin. Spin, the moon doesn't spin because its axis rotates together with the moon. That axis cannot be a one-dimensional axis because a one-dimensional axis cannot be conceptualized to spin. So nobody ever figured out in the religion of mathematics that, um, you know, that uh, the issue of whether the axis spins or it doesn't spin. They just looked at distance and they say, well, the distance of the surface with respect to the axis. But that's in mathematics, okay? In, in, in rational science and physics, normal physics, for physicists, okay, you can't use the mathematical one-dimensional axis especially to talk about spin, which is a physical phenomenon, not a mathematical phenomenon, okay? And so, uh, yeah, you've got you've to put a two-dimensional or three-dimensional axis, two-dimensional because you can explain it with that as well, not because of anything more than that. But with a three-dimensional axis, a little cylinder, you can explain the notion of spin that we have in physics, and that is if the axis, three-dimensional axis, not one-dimensional, three-dimensional axis, okay, you can tell whether it's spinning or not. And if it's spinning together with a planet, with a surface, the, the object, the celestial object, in this case the moon, is not spinning. On the other hand, in the case of the Earth, conceptually, it's as if, it's as if, it's as if the cylinder stands still and the surface of the Earth twirls uh, around. Because now every point on the surface is changing its distance with different uh, points on the three-dimensional axis. You can't do that with a one-dimensional axis, okay? That's why the mathematicians never discovered this, because they, when they used the one-dimensional axis, they could never tell or never even considered, pondered, whether the axis itself spins. That's why people don't know if the Earth, moon spins or not. They say, well, the moon spins. Why? Because it rotates around the Earth in 27 days. So what? <laughs> what is spin? Define spin, and then we'll know. And I'm saying spin has in physics has to do with the axis standing still and the surface moving with respect to a still axis. The Earth spins, so do other planets. The moon does not spin because the axis moves together with the surface, even when it goes rotates once around the Earth. And we're not asking you to agree. We're not asking you to believe. We're asking you to understand. Please try to understand before, <laughs> before one of us dies. 